Hello, huge boy fanatic day, stopping on by. This time I'm coming at you to do yet again another one of my famed movie slash Blu-ray reviews. I'm coming at you to review the movie in Blu-ray of what's this called? Sorority Babes in the Slime Ball Bolorama. Um, this this one just like the last just like the last movie I reviewed, I picked up on the FullMoonDirect.com during their. Uh, I want to say it was during their. What, what they do every year, um, the, what is it, Valentine's Day sale, where a lot of the stuff, most of the stuff on the site is 50% off, so that's, as I said on my review of Laser Blast, a lot of times during that sale I'll pick up a lot of stuff that I, you know, don't want to pay freaking $20 or more for at that time, so I probably got this hopefully for 10 bucks or hopefully for no more than $10, bucks um, because it's not worth well, it's not even worth ten bucks. So I'm going to review the movie, and then I'll review this this fantastic Blu-ray, which was done. I don't know when the hell it was done. Probably not long ago. Probably came out. I, maybe who the hell knows? It came out whenever it came out. So this this movie, unlike um, Laser Blast, is a movie that I you know, never saw before until I got this um, Blu-ray and I, like I say I got Laser Blast in frickin this movie uh, probably in February and I didn't actually watch this until just like a week ago or a few days ago for the very first time because you know there's other movies to watch who the hell wants to watch this so it was, now the weather's getting turned to shit and I found myself just you know stuck indoors so I'm like well let's watch this movie damn it so I watched uh, Sorority Babe and Slimeball Ballorama for the very first time, <clears throat> now I'm going to review it. So basically, you, you guys know if you've seen my review of Slumber Party Massacre movies and stuff, or Sorority House Massacres and stuff like that, is obviously, you know, I'm a big fan, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan, still am a big fan of these kind of, you know, TNA, you know, whatever, these B-movies that are horror movies that are like sorority-themed movies because you get an opportunity to see, you know, scantily clad and or naked women and toplessness and all this kind of stuff, shower scenes, whatever. So generally these movies like Summer Party Massacres and stuff are really, really kind of fun. Well, this movie, I mean, it starts out kind of fun in a, I don't know, th this movie you'd think might be the same way and maybe to a certain extent it is, but it should be said that this movie is directed by this David Dakota who went on to do like Puppet Master 3 and from what they say on the back of the box, it's like, Creep, Creepozoids, which is a movie that, you know, I, I haven't seen yet. It's it's high it's high on my list, I'll tell you that. Not really, but... So this guy, in my opinion, he did like the one of the the, the first of the last trilogy of most recent Puppet Master movies. This guy is just, you know... Well, I'm, I'll reserve judgment. I'll just say that his movies don't do a hell, whole hell of a lot for me. I, just in case he's watching this review, I'm not going to go crazy off on him or whatever, but... We'll just say that <clears throat> there, yeah, are probably better filmmakers than this guy. So a lot of, for the most part, unless it's like Puppet Master 3, you know, a lot of his stuff doesn't do a whole hell of a lot for me. And this is one of them. Basically, the premise of this movie is three geeks are just sitting around um, watching TV. And it, I, this, the, the one, the, one of these geeks, the one who lives at the end with the chick, is it took me like half the movie to realize who he is. But it's a guy who I think would end up going go on to play the the karate guy from Nightmare on Street Four, the karate brother of Alice or whatever. It took me forever to figure out who he was. He was bugging me. But then maybe like 30 minutes into the movie, I realized, oh, that's that's Alice's brother from from Nightmare 4. But the, he he's he's a, probably the main one of the main players in this movie. One of the three geeks, these three geeks, and one of them's fat, of course, or fatter, just sitting around watching TV, and they decide, oh, let's go, let's go to the you know sororities doing their initiation tonight. Let's go sneak up on them and maybe peep in the window or sneak inside and you know see them smacking the girls asses with a wooden pal or whatever it would be really more fun than watching this TV so they decide to go that to go do that and of course they get caught by the girls and for a while there this you know this movie is uh, kinda cool you know when they first introduced the sorority because it's actually features this movie um, features for a while not the whole movie she's not a featured player but she's in a lot more than Slumber Party Massacre this Brink Stevens and also this woman who's really kind of hot who'd go on to... The only other thing I saw her in was Puppet Master 3. She's the woman who's screwing, uh, you know, the, the guy from Sleepaway Camp 3, Walter Gotell or whatever, in, in Puppet Master 3. She's got a nice set of fake tits on her. So that, that chick is actually featured in a lot of this movie. And, of course, she ends up topless and maybe even... Maybe maybe completely naked. I can't remember. But that, that girl and... Um, 
Brink Stevens are these two like sorority girls who are you can tell this movie's super low budget because the sorority is comprised of basically five girls, three that are already, you know, running it and two that are wanna get into it. So I mean you know it's a super low budget because unlike Initiation, that fantastic movie from the mid eighties or whatever, that's got just all kinds of girls in the beginning of the movie that are part of the initiation or whatever. So this one's got a, a sorority full of, of three whole girls and two more that want to join. So, you know, obviously we see them in their underwear and they're getting bent over the couch and smacked by the wooden paddles and all this stuff where well, the guys sneak up on them and they end up sneaking into the house to see like Rink Stevens in a real, really lengthy, overly long, well, I don't know if it's overly long because she's in the shower or whatever, but scene where she's just scrubbing up with soap and stuff in the shower and stuff and they get caught looking at her in the shower and they get, I, oh, basically these, these three girls who are running the sorority or whatever say, okay, I don't know why the guys don't just run out of there like these girls have any kind of physical domination over them, but whatever, it's a dumb movie. The girls are like, okay, we'll let you go, but you, first you got to do this along with the, you know, the three geeks and the two girls who are being initiated have to go to this bowling alley and steal a trophy. That'll be, then we'll let you go and then you can do whatever. I can't remember what they say, but that's the general gist of it. So and I think this bitch, you know, this sorority bitch, the, the main, that main head honcho bitch is like a rich bitch whose dad maybe owns the mall or the bowling alley or something. I don't know. So they go to the bowling alley to do that. And, you know, for, I, I don't know if I've ever said it in any of my reviews because generally bowling doesn't come up, but I'm a bowling, you know, enthusiast. I like bowling. I kind of grew up with... You know, as a kid going to bowling alleys and stuff, and I right even now I play bowling video games and stuff. So I, I know I like bowling, and it's kind of cool to have a movie, a horror movie, take place in a bowling alley or whatever. And you know, it should be said that for taking place in a bowling alley, there's no not a whole hell of a lot of like. I, I mean, well, granted, they're not there to bowl. I guess they're granted to steal a trophy, but yeah, okay, that's why there's not a lot of bowling in the movie because they're not there to bowl. But it's kind of cool to have a movie, you know, take place in a bowling alley that's all dark and closed and stuff. Whatever. That's one of, the, I guess, one of the cooler things about the movie. So basically, when they go to break in, the, I think the, I think they don't even break in. I think it's just unlocked because I mean, this head sorority chick, I think dad owns it or something so they just open the door and they get in there and they find like oh maybe that's because Linnea Quigley's character broke in already I don't remember but they find Linnea Quigley she's also in this movie and really really nice trim shape and stuff like that obviously it's around the time of uh, this is like 87 so it's around the time of uh, Return of the Living Dead and stuff so she's in really really nice shape she plays this the kind of punk rock chick who's you know discovered by the five of these you know these three or these three guys and two girls who are trying to steal the trophy she's discovered by them trying to rob the you know the register and just rob the joint in general she's even trying to pry open like the video game coin boxes and all this crap she's after every you know every red cent she can find in this place she's you know plays the same kind of part that she basically plays in Night of the Demons I, she probably plays the same kind of just I don't know character in all the movies you know it's just same attitude like I say she's same character in all the movies or whatever um, but you know as I say she's got like tight pants on and she's in really great shape so it's really fun to look at her in these tight pants at this time it's, it's strange because this is more of a featured part for actually Linnea Quigley you know and the guy from Nightmare 4 are kind of the, the the main players so as a result we actually this is I think the only Linnea Quigley movie I've ever seen where she's not actually seen in one point topless or whatever so she must be getting up well even in you know night of the demons when she was a more feature player she did topless so it was interesting to see her actually not do topless in this you'd think that uh particularly with the title the sorority babes you know that uh what's his name would you know want to get her topless but i guess there's enough topless with this other chick that you really don't need her but topless but it's weird seeing Linnea Quigley in a movie where she's not topless that's generally not how it goes for me so at some point they actually go to the you know where the trophies are seen and there's this big trophy and I, I don't remember someone that grabs it maybe they're like oh we'll take this one or maybe they're arguing with it I don't remember but for some reason the trophy ends up being dropped in this like you know ooh, it releases this kind of mystical kind of you might want to call it a gremlin well at this time you know they'd already done i think ghoulies and i think they were either doing ghoulies 2 or about to do ghoulies 2 so this 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 thing that emerges from the i don't know it's not even well it's like right there you i'll, I'll put better shots of it or whatever but the stupid thing that emerges from the 
oh my god, the, the, this you know this trophy is so freaking stupid. And like I say, it's it's the late it's the late eighties, so we're like I mean, we're kind of still on the whole Gremlins, Ghoulies thing. So this kind of ghoulie, if you will, what do they call it in the movie? It's called a they call it an imp. As a matter of fact, the the original title of this movie was gonna be the imp, which isn't a very good title because. What the hell is an imp? I don't know if an imp is a well-known word for a ghoulie thing. I don't know, but they call this thing in the movie the imp, which I'm, I'm just going to call the ghoulie, just appears, and it's just a kind of animatronic puppeted thing that's just supposed to be all cool. I thought it was a black guy who did the voice for this, but I guess it's not a black guy who did the voice for it, having watched a little bit of the supplements on the Blu-ray, but uh, this thing, this imp appears and starts giving people wishes, and oh my god. I don't even remember, you know, what the wishes are, what, oh yeah, yeah, someone like wants gold and the gold appears and someone else wants to have been the prom queen and she turns into the prom queen and this other guy gets all lucky with this chick from, you know, who would go on to be in Topless and Screw and Walter Gotel and Pubmaster 3 and she ends up basically just, God, this must have taken forever to shoot this scene because it goes on and on where you keep, you know, as the movie goes on, we keep revisiting it where this, they're in the, like the locker room and she eat the guys on the floor and this woman's all horny and, you know, this try, she's in a, one of his, I guess his wish was to screw this chick or whatever, which makes no sense because when she wants him, he's like all hesitant and stuff and, you know, this scene, which is interspersed throughout the movie as it goes on, just see, it seems to just go on forever and ever and ever. But uh, whatever, you know, I guess that's what this kind of movie is all about, is like toplessness and naked women and stuff or whatever. But this, like, this woman, like I say, who did end up being up, showing up, and where I first saw her, or at least first remember seeing her as Puppet Master 3, she's got a really nice kind of, you know, artificially enhanced body and stuff. And it was kind of cool to see her actually in this part where she begins her role in this movie with act, you know, quote unquote acting or whatever. So instead of just being a topless chick in the movie, she's actually kind of a little bit of a part in this movie. So, huh. Oh yeah, none other than George Buck Flower is actually in this movie as a janitor. He's probably one of the most entertaining characters, if not the most entertaining character to watch in this movie. Uh, later on, he basically tells the whole tale of, you know, the why the hell the ghoulie is in the thing and it was kind of a probably one of the most you know how exposition scenes are always kind of just boring this is one of the more inter interesting exposition scenes and probably the first time I've seen Buck Flower give an exposition scene and because it was just the same kind of character he plays in every movie of course just because kind of, it's just gentle kind of doofy personality he he made this exposition scene really kind of interesting of which which is um the whole backstory is like freaking decades past. There was some bowler who was a shitty bowler who wanted to be a good bowler, and I think he came across this imp and he asked it for a wish to become a good bowler, and he became a good bowler. And then, as a result, there's something. Also, there's these naysayers, these bullies, these jerks who, you know, made fun of him for being a shitty bowler that he either had killed or killed himself or whatever. And I don't know. This is all just told, obviously, by Buck Flower and exposition scene and. I don't know what if the cops got after him or whatever, but I think um, I don't know if it was Buck Flowers' character who years ago, you know, decades past, is the one who actually trapped the imp in the frickin' uh, the trophy or whatever. So I think that's the whole backstory, which is you know, for for a movie of this kind of genre and budget and stuff, it's kind of a decent backstory. And to be honest, as I said, you know, it's one of the more interesting exposition scenes, just because good old Buck Flowers is, is providing it. So that's the whole backstory of the movie and. Obviously, that them accidentally dropping this trophy released the imp and all this kind of crap. So that's why it's all pandemonium and hell happening at the bowling alley. So there's a lot of this movie that I don't even remember because it's just mostly not particularly interesting. But at some point in the movie, like two of the, I want to say two or all, you know, them three sorority bitches. I want to say at least two of the three bitches get like possessed and turned into just. I don't know, killers or whatever. I can't remember who does the killing in this movie, if it's those soror three sorority bitches that are like possessed or whatever. But people do start dying in, in non-amazing non ways. The, the fatter, more heavier, you know, geek of the three geek guys gets his head cut off in a scene that's really kind of cool and appropriate. Uh, actually gets his head bowled down a bowling alley and because the head doesn't really roll very well, of course, ended up in the gutter. And I think there's some cutesy line where some characters like, oh, it's a gutter head or whatever, which, ha <laughs> It's kind of one of the more clever parts of this movie and obviously to have a horror movie take place in a bowling alley and obviously a very, you know, a, a scene that was, or an idea that was 
you know, very a missed up. It could have been a missed opportunity if they hadn't bowled someone's head down the, the bowling lane or whatever. So it would have been kind of cooler if, you know, the head had gotten a strike probably than just getting a gutter head. But whatever. At least they bowled a head down the alley. I think one of the other geeks ends up with his face, you know, getting deep fried in the, you know, deep fryer and stuff like that. So it's it's that, you know, the, the effects obviously aren't anything to blow your ass away. But I do remember that the severed head, I think, being relatively good resemblance to the, the, the guy who played it or whatever. So, I mean, that's cool, I guess. Oh yeah, during that exposition scene with uh, Buck Flower, there's, he's, he's like hard, his character is hard of hearing, so they made some fun with that. And that was actually, made me actually laugh some scenes with that where the girl would say something and he'd say no no actually not and he, he thought she said something else and so that that was you know he she really said something different so they, they had some fun with that scene and buck flower did really really well in that scene it was kind of one of the more interesting fun scenes i've ever seen him uh in a movie do because usually he's more of a side character and this time he was the main focus because he was given the you know the backstory to the whole reason why everything was happening in the movies, so it was kind of one of the rare occasions where Buck Flower was kind of front and center. So it was, and you know, it made you wish he was, you know, that front and center more often because he was uh, really entertaining in this scene. So, so after the other three, or the other two of the three geeks get killed, of course, and other people die, I can't even remember. You know, I'm sure that chick who from Pubmaster 3 probably ends up dying. I don't even remember, you know, what the hell happens. But of course, you know, the, the guy from Nightmare, the karate guy from Nightmare 4 and Linnea Quigley, like, Linnea Quigley's character stuffs, I think, the imp back into some kind of jar or some kind of, some kind of something. I don't think it's the freaking trophy again, but it's something like the same size or whatever. And they just basically use, uh one of these demon sorority girls to break out, you know, break the spell and be able to actually get out of the bowling alley and they do this really lame kind of stunt, car stunt where the, you know, the, the guy from Nightmare 4 is, is driving and he's, you know, accosted by the imp in the back and he does, they do this really lame kind of car where they roll this car over and it's all supposed to be like the last final big shabam of the movie or whatever. It's just like, give me a break. And what ends up happening, of course, is Linnea Quigley and this guy from Nightmare 4 karate guy end up riding off literally not into the sunset but riding off on her motorcycle so you know all's 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 happy and at the end of this movie I guess except for the viewer of course if you made it all the, all the way to the end of this movie then you're not happy because you you wasted however many minutes you know 80 minutes or whatever or maybe even more uh, watching this movie um, it's kind of painful to be honest so I was kind of teetering between a half of a star and three quarters. Tell you what, we'll do them a favor. We'll go as high as three quarters of a star out of four stars for uh, Sorority Babes and the Slime Ball Bolarama, only because it captures the late, you know, this is like '87 or whatever. So it captures the late '80s in a fun kind of way, and there's some in particular, there's some particularly, you know, relatively attractive female nudity in, in this movie, and. You know, taking place at a bowling alley, and even though the bowling, you know, bowling the head down the, the down the alley didn't, you know, break the pins in a in a strike or anything like that, it's still kind of cool and, and whatever. And seeing Linnea, Linnea Quigley and the guy who'd go on to be in Nightmare Four and stuff, and George Buckflower and some familiar faces and familiar tits, you know, I will be able to go as high as whatever I gave it. What I three out of three quarters stars out of four. So that's my review of the movie on to the brief review of the recently I would well, I don't know when the hell this came out. The the Blu-ray of Slime of Sorority Babes and the Slime Ball Bolarama. This one is actually from what they say, they were able to find the original camera negative and the, the you know the, the 2K transfer is said to have been, you know, came, you know, mastered from the actual camera negative. And of course you've got full moon 5.1 surround, which I don't imagine is much of anything at all. But the image I will say, well, you can, I have nothing to compare this to because I've never, this is the first time I've seen it. But the image for the most part is absolutely fantastic. There were some shots, just random shots, I don't know why, that seemed to be more soft than the majority of the movie. But the, the transfer is fantastic, as I said in my last review of, of Laser Blast. It seems like full moon is, is really up in the ante and getting Whoever, whoever does these transfers for them, I don't know, it seems like they're getting better at it, um, which is good because a lot of their first early Blu-rays were left a lot to be desired. This movie's got some more features in the Laser Blast. It's got Tales from the Bowling Alley, a never-before-seen behind-the-scenes featurette, which um, 
I don't know why they call it a featurette because it's like two hours and 16 minutes long. It's like a combination of like recent or interviews like from now and just video VHS behind the scenes footage. And what's so funny about that is, you know, of course, David, uh, with his audio comp, another thing about the, another feature in this movie is Full Moon Trailers and then audio commentary with David Dakota and the writer and screen cream Brink Stevens. And what's so funny about uh, the two hour and 16 minute, you know, Tales from the Bowling Alley retrospective documentary thing is he, he does commentary on that. Which is just, I, I, yeah, I didn't listen to it because, come on, he, this guy can go on and on and on. But it's so funny, it's like, you know, I, uh, <laughs> I didn't bother with the commentary for either of the commentaries because I only, like, listen to it if it's, like, Charles Band or someone that I want to hear. Like, this, I don't really care what this guy has to say. If you're David, if you're watching, nothing personal. But, um, so it does have a commentary with the director and writer and Brink Stevens from What It Sales on the Back. And, like I say, a commentary from David Ducoto over the two hour and 16 minute making of, which is so funny because, I mean, he does interviews in the making of, what's he gonna do, like comment on what he says in the interviews? It's just, I've never seen a commentary on a making, <laughs> on a making of video before. So that's, I don't know if he does the whole thing or not, probably. So that, that was kind of funny, you know, seeing the, oh my God. So anyway, that'll probably be pretty much my review of the movie and the Blu-ray. Those are the only special features really. And how long is this? Yeah, it says 80 minutes. It seems a lot longer than that. But um, that's probably my review of the, the movie of Sorority Bangs and the Slime Ball Wallarama. And the, the Blu-ray, um, you know, if you want to hear David Dakota speak, you're in luck because you've got 80 minutes, probably plus, you know, 2 hours and 16 minutes of total commentary time by him in this Blu-ray release. So if you're a fan of his, you might want to pick this up just to hear him talk or whatever. Um, I guess that pretty much does it for my review of the movie and the Blu-ray. And as always, or I mean, thank you very much for watching. And as always, we'll catch you on the next movie and or Blu-ray review.